there are two major ways in which cap-independent translation occurs. One utilizes upstream open reading frames, and the other utilizes internal ribosome entry sites. We will discuss both of them in this video, but our main focus will be on iris. Specifically, in this video, we'll see what exactly is cap-independent translation initiation, how it happens, and why cap-independent translation initiation is important, and how it fits into a bigger picture. And just for your notes, cap-independent translation initiation does not exist in prokaryotes. Well, because they don't have 5' prime caps in their mRNA. So, cap-independent translation initiation is a property of mRNAs in eukaryotes, as well as viruses. And we'll discuss both of them in this video. Let's first simply begin by defining cap-independent translation initiation, which is the process of starting translation without depending on the 5' prime cap of the mRNA. And in some cases, it can even bypass the requirement for initiation factors that are needed in a typical translation initiation. We have discussed the canonical or typical translation initiation already, and 90% of the eukaryotic mRNAs depend on the 5' prime cap for the translation initiation. For a brief review, the 5' prime end of the mRNA typically has a methyl guanosine cap, and the poly-A tail on the other end is decorated by poly-A binding proteins. The poly-A tail usually interacts with a bunch of initiation factors that bind to both the cap and the poly-A tail, and they help to further recruit other factors. These factors are the initiation factor family 4, and are named EIF4G, 4E, 4A, and 4B. And once these cap-associated factors assemble on the mRNA, they help load this mRNA onto the 43S pre-initiation complex. I have a separate video that goes into the details of cap-dependent translation initiation. The link to that is down in the description as well as linked on the top right. And just for the sake of completion, here's the complete 43S initiation complex after the loading of the mRNA, along with the initiation factors and the initiator tRNA. And after this complex assembles, the 40S subunit scans for the start codon AUG to position it at the P site. And this is the sort of the first half of the canonical translation initiation that depends on the cap binding factors. Now, let's talk about cap independent translation initiation. And we'll start by discussing the upstream open reading frame. Upstream open reading frame is a short open reading frame within the 5' untranslated region. Here, for example, in this mRNA, you have two open reading frames, from AUG to UGA. The one which is contained in a 5' UTR is called the upstream open reading frame, simply because it is present upstream of the coding region. And if this mRNA were to be translated by the ribosome, the ribosome will not distinguish the first open reading frame from the second open reading frame. The ribosome will utilize the 5' cap to start the translation as usual from the first open reading frame. And as usual, the initiation factors will be recruited onto the mRNA, which is then loaded onto the ribosome. And after the 43S initiation complex has formed, the 60S subunit joins, and the ribosome then will go into the canonical elongation phase. But the translation in this first open reading frame will terminate at the stop codon, which is the UGA. But the 40S subunit does not actually dissociate from the mRNA, and it keeps scanning for the start codon here, which is the AUG. And while scanning occurs, the eukaryotic initiation factor 2, which is in complex with the initiator tRNA, gets recruited onto the subunit. This process of ribosome scanning is called ribosome read-through which is that even after translation has terminated, the 40S subunit continues to scan for a start codon. And when it finds the start codon, the 60S subunit is again recruited onto this 40S subunit, and the translation continues into an elongation step. Now, just to reiterate here, the upstream open reading frame translation initiation depends on the cap binding factors, but the initiation at the second open reading frame only depends on non-cap binding initiation factors. And this sums up our discussion on what upstream open reading frames are and how they're utilized to initiate translation. 
Now let's move on to the IRS, also known as internal ribosome entry sites, which is simply an RNA sequence within the 5' UTR of the mRNA that has some potential to start translation. The IRS containing mRNAs have a longer 5' UTRs than the mRNAs which do not have IRS in their 5' UTR. These internal ribosome entry sequences also tend to have a higher GC content, and they also form strong secondary structures like hairpins and stem loops. And these secondary structures prevent the ribosome scanning on the mRNA. So finding the start codon becomes very difficult. And additionally, because of these secondary structures, RNA binding proteins can also bind to these IRS sequences. Remember, we said that iris exists in both eukaryote and viruses? So let's first talk about the types of internal ribosome entry sites in eukaryotes. The first type of iris can bind or recruit ribosomes through proteins called ITAFs. More on this in a moment. In these types of iris, sometimes additional initiation factors are needed, and these factors can either be canonical or non-canonical initiation factors. The second type of IRS contains motif or sequences that pair with the 18S ribosomal RNA in the 40S subunit directly, and therefore recruit it. This type of IRS is similar to the function of shine delgarno sequence that we saw in the prokaryotes. Let's make this explanation a bit more explicit. The second type of internal ribosome entry site forms a strong secondary structure, which is present in the 5' UTR. The structure is especially important because it pairs with the 18S ribosomal RNA, which is present in the 40S subunit. This recruitment of the 40S subunit then further helps to recruit initiation factors. When this complex forms, the 40S subunit then can scan for the start codon and enter the elongation phase of the translation as usual. This second type of IRS is quite straightforward. The first type of internal ribosome entry site requires ITAFs, which are iris transacting factors. Actually, many different proteins can act as ITAFs. So ITAF is not a name of a single protein. And these ITAFs are RNA binding proteins, and specifically they bind to the secondary structures that are formed in the ribosome entry site. Some examples of these proteins include poly C binding protein, LA autoantigen, which you may have heard in autoimmunity. LA autoantigen is also needed for RNA polymerase 3 transcription. Then there is a protein called pyrimidine tract binding protein, also known as PTB, which is involved in transport, splicing, and stability of the mRNAs. Quite an unlikely candidate for ITAF, but it is what it is. And these proteins can be either cell type specific or even tissue type specific. Additionally, these ITAFs have the potential to bind modified bases that may be present in the internal ribosome entry sequences. One such base is the M6A that we discussed in the RNA processing and modification video. That video is also linked down in the description. There are two main ways in which ITAFs work. One utilizes the canonical initiation factors. The process begins when the ITAFs recognize the secondary structure formed by the IRS in the 5' UTR. Then the ITAFs recruit the 40S subunit through some unknown mechanism. These ITAFs also help in the recruitment of the canonical initiation factors like IF2 and IF3. So following the recruitment of initiator tRNA and canonical initiation factors, the 40S subunit scans for a start codon, and when it finds the start codon, it enters the elongation stage. The second way ITAFs work is through non-canonical initiation factors. Again, the process starts when the ITAFs bind to the IRS secondary structure in the 5' UTR, and once again, through some unknown mechanism, recruit the 40S subunit onto the mRNA. But now, instead of IF2 and IF3, they recruit EIF2D, which carries the initiator tRNA, and some other factors like DENR and MCT1. We saw these non-canonical initiation factors when we discussed translation termination in eukaryotes. It is unclear why or what makes the ITAF recruit these non-canonical initiation factors over canonical initiation factors. Anyways, when this complex assembles, the 40S subunit scans for the start codon, 
recruits the 60S subunit, and goes into the elongation phase. And this completes our discussion on what eukaryotic internal ribosome entry sites are, and how they work. So we have discussed the types of IRS in eukaryotes, and we said in the beginning that even some viruses have internal ribosome entry sites. Some viruses, actually quite a lot of them, don't even have 5' prime cap in their mRNA. So let's talk about viral internal ribosome entry sites. Specifically, there are four classes of viral IRS. The first three classes are similar to the two types of iris that we saw in the eukaryotes. So those are not that interesting because they're very similar. But class 4 iris is very interesting because it requires no initiation factors or ITAFs. This means that it does not depend on canonical or non-canonical initiation factors. The remarkable property of class 4 iris is that it forms a secondary structure which mimics the tRNA structure itself. Note that tRNA itself is a secondary structure, with many stem loops and hairpins. Let's understand how class 4 IRS works by taking an example of cricket paralysis virus mRNA. The 5' UTR mimics the tRNA structure, and it can recruit the ribosome directly. All this happens when the virus has infected a cell. And this secondary structure positions itself at the p-site of the 40S subunit. And this structure mimics the structure of an initiator tRNA. Now, the bases immediately after the p-site become the codon that is located at the a-site, and the preceding bases specify the e-site, which is empty. This is the 40S initiation complex, which is ready for 60S subunit to bind. Now, when the ADS ribosome assembles, it is ready for the a-site codon to be translated, which means that the new tRNA will be brought in by the eukaryotic elongation factor 1, and so it positions itself at the a-site. Now if you take a closer look and recall the elongation stage of translation in eukaryotes, this is exactly what we saw in the elongation video where we discussed the hybrid state of the ADS ribosome complex. This ribosome now is ready for elongation factor 2, which will help in the translocation of the ribosome to the next codon. Note that in this process of translation of this viral mRNA, you only require elongation factors. And this is exactly what we said in the first place, that no initiation factors are needed. So this form of internal ribosome entry site completely bypasses the need for any initiation factor. And this completes our discussion on internal ribosome entry sites. But now we must discuss the importance of such ribosome entry sites and how they fit into the bigger picture. The first point is in the evolution of translation factors where a synergy is required between the RNA and proteins. Based on our discussion of class 4 viral internal ribosome entry site, it suggests that initiation factors may have evolved after the elongation factors. Because, of course, to start the translation, elongation you don't need initiation factors as long as the 5' UTR of the mRNA itself can somehow mimic the initiator tRNA structure. This also suggests that 5' cap may have evolved afterwards as well, because clearly you don't need cap binding factors if you have a working IRS. In the beginning, we said that 90% of eukaryotic mRNA depends on the 5' cap for translation initiation. Now, what about the remaining 10% of the mRNA? Well, it turns out that during apoptosis or stress response, the cap dependent translation initiation is inhibited. Specifically, during apoptosis, the initiation factor 4G is cleaved, and 4G binds to the poly-A tail of the mRNA, and it also interacts with the initiation factor 4E. And if initiation factor 4G is cleaved, it can no longer bind to the initiation factor 4E, which is present at the cap of the mRNA. And even if it can bind to 4A and 4B factors, this means that cap-dependent translation initiation cannot start but the EIF4G can still take part in the canonical initiation through ITAFs. So during apoptosis or stress response, the energy is diverted to cap-independent translation initiation. Specifically, this can lead to a programmed cell death during apoptosis, or during stress response, it can activate rescue and recovery processes and mechanism. The other part of the bigger picture of internal ribosome entry sites is that during viral infection, and typically viral infections also cleave initiation factor 4G. One virus that you may have heard that has this activity is the polio virus. 
other viruses like cricket paralysis virus destroy the initiation factor 4E. So cap-dependent initiation shuts off. And it also destroys initiation factor 1-alpha by phosphorylating it. Both of these are essential for cap-dependent translation. And their inhibition means that the host cells can no longer start the process of initiation of translation. So during this viral infection by cricket paralysis virus, 90% of the mRNA translation, which depends on the 5' cap, cannot be translated. So the host translation is shut off. And if the initiation factors cannot be used, the viral ribosome entry site is the only option left for the translation machinery. And because the cricket paralysis virus only destroys initiation factors, means that the elongation factors are still active. And we have seen that cricket paralysis virus does not need initiation factors, it only needs elongation factors. So the virus easily wins in this situation. And these are some of the interesting reasons how CAP-independent translation initiation fits into various biological processes. And this wraps up our discussion.